Jamila brings a wealth of international knowledge, having worked in multicultural organizations such as Green Climate Fund and the Commonwealth Secretariat. And we studied together at the University for Peace Costa Rica. So we know each other really well. So she is always supporting Eco Peace Teen Cafe and a nice mentor to all of us. So thanks, Jamila, for joining today. And now the floor is yours. Thank you, Grishma, for the warm welcome. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's session. I love intimate settings, so I like that it's only a few of us. You know, hopefully we can have a great discussion today. Um, and as Grishma said, we have studied together and I have a long-standing relationship with Eco Peace Team Cafe. So it's nice to join you again and to reconnect with old faces and old friends. Um, and I actually wanted to contribute to the question today, and I like um, Cindy's angle on on uh, reaching out to religious leaders and faith leaders. And I was thinking about how there was always a separation of church and state, um, and that one cannot influence the other, or if it was seen as presumptuous to have one influence the other. But then you think about the power that a lot of religious leaders have, not only in how they endorse, um, you know, members of government or political parties, but also the power that they have in, in their congregation, um, the trust that their congregation has in them and the position that they have to, to influence and, and to steer people in certain directions. And I think it's interesting that that influence only is utilized in a religious aspect, but not other aspects of life, as if other aspects of life don't contribute to, you know, to our livelihoods. So it would be great. You know, I haven't seen it done how religion and environmentalism will come together, or even peace building would come together. At least I haven't seen it done in my country context, but it would be interesting to see that. Um, so yes, I have a few slides today, but I really want to encourage you know, an interactive session. I don't want to be talking to myself here. Um, I really wanted to hear from other people, from your perspective, from your opinion, even if you disagree with me, even if you can bring information from your, your part of the world. Um, <clears throat> that would be really valuable. I know we have persons joining from the Philippines today, from the UK. Um, we have... Uh, you know, so I do welcome you to, to pitch in. Um, I'll be speaking for 20 minutes. And um, then we will have breakout sessions. I don't know if we have enough persons for breakout rooms. But as we go along and as persons join, we can decide, you know, if we would just have a general discussion or if we'll have the breakout room. And then there are a series of questions whereby we'll ask questions, um, we'll discuss uh, different topics. There'll be a Q&A and then we'll wrap up at the end of the two hours. So um, if you can change slides, uh, I really thought it was good to start with definition and then to setting the scene so that we all have a common understanding of what, we, what we're talking about. Um, and I thought that youth, peace and environment is a very general topic. It's very broad and there's so many angles that I can um, take it from. And even though my background is in policy development, I didn't want to get too technical. Um, you know, I wanted to be as general as possible. So I thought it would be important to define youth or young people um, as we use interchangeably generally, ranges from the ages of 15 to 24. That's how the UN defines it. Um, but I'm beyond that age bracket and I still consider myself to be young. So sometimes I can extend up to 35 years. So ideally from the age of adolescence up to 35 years is what's considered youth. And by 2030, which is the target for the sustainable development goals, it's projected that youths will make up about 1.3 billion people in the world, which amounts to 7% of the global population. Um, and 80% of the world's youth population is found in the global south. And many people in the global south are feeling the impacts of climate change, are feeling the impacts of land degradation and biodiversity loss. 
And it's also projected that 28% of Africa's population and 52% of Asia's population will be comprised of young people. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the aging populations in East Asia, like Japan and Korea, who are struggling to, um, you know, struggling with the birth rate. And, um, and they've taken many steps to address that. But, you know, how effective that will be, that's another discussion. Um, and so what I'd like to ask everyone is, how do you define peace? What does peace look like in your countries? What does peace look like in your region? Um, I know some of us are from countries that are undergoing, um, that are going through difficult uh, instabilities and wars at the moment. But if you can put it in the chat, or if you'd like to raise your hand and answer the question, you know, what does peace look like to you? So for me, peace is mostly with inner peace and how um, calm and how happy I am. So peace and happiness is connected for me and uh, when it comes to my community I would say it's mostly connected with positive peace like how everyone's needs are meeting like how everyone have their basic needs and also like how um, how the like in in Indian context it's mostly like the relationship between the religions and peace between this peace creating like more peace and harmony among different religious communities so this both are my concern and my way of seeing peace like living in more peace harmony and happiness yeah i know that you said harmony i would consider that as well is there anyone else who would like to come in how would you define peace and what does it look like in your country or your region I mean, I think I'll just step in. I know this is very important in uh, word because of uh, the current situation. And, and I recently was in a holiday in Bosnia. And um, some of you might remember the Bosnian genocide where I visited the museum of, and um, museum of, um, and uh, crime against humanity. And there's no winner in war. So peace is opposite of war. That's uh, key. And, and I would say also respecting each other's and uh, boundaries and uh, and uh, sharing a collective and um, collective and value as well. So that is what I would and put add to the points already made. Thank you so much. I I like that you said you know for some peace is the absence of war, and um, that's actually how they would define negative peace is the absence of direct violence or the fear of violence. Um, and positive peace, on the other hand, is the absence of indirect structural violence that exists in institutions, that exists in structures of society. But for some, negative peace is, is the best case scenario and it's the most that you can wish for and the most that you can ask for, just the absence of violence. But is it possible to go beyond that? Um, you know, that's something to think about. So if there's no one else that wants to add um, to that, see we have in the chat. Peace is a harmonious relationship between people, countries, probably absence of armed conflicts and violence response, right, with respect to differences. Thank you, Natalia. All right. I see Cindy, you have your hand raised, and then Abarna. Thank you. Um, I, I have a very odd <laughs> odd take on peace. Um, my peace is not nice and comfortable and smooth at all. Um, the best peace that I could sense is actually with people who disagree with each other, um, believe in different things, are not the same peoples, but they are, but they are together, and and they can not only survive but live well together. If you can muster up, you know, respect and understanding and 
empathy and all of that. Of course, that's good. Um, but then that's that's not peace that you work hard for. So it it's almost like if you can get there by yourself, um, you feel that almost on your personal side, whether it is peace out there or not, as long as you are not impacting it, it's okay. But peace to me is involving other people who are different, who don't agree. And you know, you know you don't agree with each other, but can still make, you know, the 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 dealing with each other something that's not just tolerable, not just negative peace, but actively working to make make that happen. Um maybe not harmony, but at least it's to make that, um, take that step, a difficult step of, of um, mutual respect. I don't know whether I'm making sense or not, but the, yeah, the, the piece that I see is something that you work very hard for. It's not something that kind of comes to you and then it's all nice. Thank you. Cindy um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, uh, so I, uh, it was quite a, um, you know, I was trying to think, was there a way when you, when I saw the question, was it possible to define peace without using the word harmony was, because every time I tried to think of it that way, uh, the word harmony is what kept resonating. And it was quite surprising because the others also brought up that word. And there's that, is that, you know, actually possible was something that does did I did think about and what Cindy said also um about it's you know fine to have people having different opinions and this thing. And what I had when I was listening to you, Cindy, was that it it should feel like a place where you can be safe in your identity, sort of um having being able to feel safe in your own identity and knowing that there may be people who complete don't understand you at all but that's still okay you would still be safe in their presence that sort of security i think would be a good word for me uh in terms of um what a peaceful way would be right doesn't mean that there can't be disagreements it's just that there is a sense of security that goes with being in any different environment like that as well Thank you, Aparna. So I like that you said the security and as Cindy mentioned, um, the tolerance that different groups of people have to each other as well as the respect. Because I was um, thinking about how do you have peace as the end goal and the true goal? That means that you have to make active decisions if you live in a society that has different groups of people, different groups of thinking, to not only be tolerable, but to be, you know, respectful, to bear in mind that you have a societal responsibility and a personal responsibility to be accepting um, to different groups of people. And that who your true sense of being should not inflict on others, should not compromise how others live their lives. Um, and so that's what I had in mind. Thank you for sharing. I see Nelly shared in the chat. Peace is a concept that reflects the state of calm and tranquility, and also the absence of conflicts between different nations and ethnic groups. And Shindi said, uh, shared security, right. So thank you everyone for input. Is there now I'd like to discuss um, the role that youths and young people play in positive societal transformations and societal change, and the added benefit that young people as a demographic can bring. And I was doing some research and I was trying to figure out, okay, what angle, you know, do I focus on policy making? Do I focus on peace building, on environmentalism? Um, but generally I wanted to, to pinpoint the characteristics that youth as a demographic has. And I found that generally you'll find young people who are tech savvy, who are good with social media, who are open to social media. Um, who are more idealistic and flexible, 
especially mental, mentally flexible and open to change. And when I say mentally flexible, I mean young people generally, you know, we're just generalizing here, are more receptive to developing relationships that are cross border, that are across um, different groups, ethnic groups, religious groups, that are more tolerant of differences, and they're able to deconstruct prejudices and challenge injustice. And I'm sure these um, traits can be found in older groups of people. Um, but, you know, there's a saying that you, well, I shouldn't say that, but, um, and it's been found as well that a country's youthfulness uh, positively correlates to its instability. And not to say that the younger a population is, you know, the more violent or unstable it is, that's not to say that, but it's been found that young people are more readily challenging the status quo are more vocal and open to fighting back against government, against leaders, against injustice. Um, and on the environmental front, you would have seen, especially in 2020 around the pandemic, there are a lot of youth movements that were emerging. There were Fridays for Future. I'm sure you've heard of the Greta Thunbergs of the world who um, made themselves visible in the global and the national sense to fight against climate change against land degradation and biodiversity loss. And many of these youth movements came about because young people felt as though their voices weren't being heard. They weren't taken seriously, especially by policymakers, by their leaders and by their government. And many of these young people were advocating for systemic change. They're advocating for reimagining and the rebuilding of the social structures, the economic and the environmental structures. Um, and so they would have gone out in marches and strikes and protests, but it calls into question how effective are these youth movements? Um, is making noise the best way to be heard? But um, you have things to say, but I think it's important how you tell your story and who you're telling your story to. Are you speaking to the right people? Are you targeting the right groups? I mean, you want to target the people that are most influential in a society. But are those always members of government? I mean, you spoke about faith leaders and religious leaders. Sometimes they're the most influential in the society. Um, and so you would have seen many of these youth movements and protests that they're just targeted generally, um, but they lack institutional backing and, and political momentum. Um, and oftentimes, you know, young people end up being arrested, but unfortunately, in other parts of the world, you don't have the luxury of speaking out against your government. You know, sometimes it costs you your livelihood, sometimes it costs you your life. And I'll speak more about that later. But overall, um, in my line of work, I've found um, youths have been left out um, from policy making around climate, around peace building and security. Oftentimes, in these processes, these high-level discussions that are being had, young people are mostly brought in towards the end, just to say they've had diversity, um, just to say that they're you know, bringing young people in as tokens, but not as active participants in the process, not as active participants in the decisions that are being made. Um, and I think young people should have a right to decide their future, you know, how you can leave someone out of the conversation when they're the people that you're talking about. Um, and so on the other hand, you have a lot of work that's being done on the grassroots level and on a local level that's not gaining traction or global attention. So then how can you bridge the gap between you have the people at the top that are neglecting the people at the bottom? and the people at the bottom that are fighting for their voices to be heard and fighting to be recognized. And many times they lack the infrastructure, they lack the digital infrastructure. You can have youth movements from rural communities that don't have access to internet, don't have access to, to social media. They lack finances to scale up the work that they do. So there are several limitations that exist. And also there's the imbalance where you know, a lot of the young people in the global south who are feeling the brunt of the you know environmental impacts, they're not being uh, welcomed on the international stage. Um, you know, you have a lot of these UN conferences, the climate change conferences, and many of them are people from the global north who can afford to participate, who are already in these spaces, and um, 
don't clear the path for others to join in. Um, so activism by the sense, and I say that because a strategy that's being used is uh, civil disobedience. You would have seen, I know in the US, um, there are a lot of pipeline projects that um, have been designated for indigenous spaces, for tribal lands that have cultural significance. And an act of civil disobedience is occupying that space and preventing mining from happening, um, fighting against businesses, fighting against government. Um, but oftentimes, as I mentioned, you know, those are, are those activists are being retaliated with violence. Um, so we have to think about what's the most effective way to get a message across. Um, and so that's what I'll present on in the next slide. Uh, I wanted to bring a story to everyone. I think it's important to speak on real life scenarios and not just speaking generally. So I found a statistic from Colombia. If we can switch slides. Um, and I found that this, you know, it presents that two things can be true at the same time. Firstly, I came across there's a young subsistence farmer, rural farmer from Colombia. His name is Saul Alvarez Gonzalez. Not only is he Colombian, but he's of African descent, which in Colombia has been grouped as a minority or as a demographic that's not um, really taken seriously or regarded in the society. And him and his peers have found a youth peace provokers movement in his district in Colombia, which whereby they come together and they mobilize young people to organize national strikes, to rally communities, calling for peace, and also integrating, you know, environmentalism in different sectors. So the health sector, how climate change has an effect on our health, how climate change affects the agricultural sector, um, education, as well as sports and other and you know other sectors as well. And I thought it was interesting having the contrast of um, a person like himself and the work that he's able to do contrasted with the reality um, that being an environmentalist in some countries is a death wish. Um, that, you know, fighting for a good cause and fighting for the right thing can cause you your life, unfortunately. And the NGO Global Witness found that 177 environmentalists were killed in 2022 last year. And Latin America as a region accounts for 88% of these attacks. And many of the victims of these attacks are um, Latinos of African descent, indigenous peoples, uh, farmers from rural communities, as well as land right owners in Colombia. And it's interesting that, that Colombia um, you know, is leading in numbers because last year, they had ratified the Escazú Agreement, and I don't know if persons are familiar with the Escazú Agreement, but it's a treaty that was signed covering Latin America and the Caribbean that protects access to information, especially access to public environmental information. It secures the right of the general public to fight against, sorry, to be in, involved in environmental decision making as well as policy making. And the Escosu Agreement also calls for the protection of environmental defenders. And just last year, Colombia ratified this agreement. But also last year, Colombia had the highest number of environmentalists killed. So I think it's important to recognize that even though the policies are in place, they lack reinforcement, they lack uptake, they lack recognition. Um, and it only goes so far when you have words on paper, but the action that you see in a day-to-day -day basis does not reflect it. And I'm so I'm sure many of us can be frustrated when we think about our leaders in our countries that we have laws. Um, but when you make a certain amount of money, you're completely exempt from those laws. You're exempt from accountability. Um, and so this is just one example that I wanted to shed light on. Um, you know, in, in the global north, it, sometimes it's a luxury, as I said, to speak out against government. You know, you can sit down in front of parliament with a sign that says, um, shame on you, but in other parts of the country, it can be very detrimental. So I think it's important to understand how we convey the message that we want to convey, who we're speaking to, and to make sure that it lands 
on the right ears. And so if you can move to the next slide, please. Um, I think this is our final slide before we move into the breakout sessions. Um, but I really wanted to touch on, you know, I spoke about the problems that exist, but I also wanted to shed light on the strategies that are being adopted by several organizations that are being adopted globally to address and to involve young people in peace, environment, and security discussions. Um, so I came across the United Nations Interagency Network on this development. They had released this policy document about 10 years ago, but I couldn't find an updated version. Um, but there are many um, strategies that are presented that I think are very vital to know and very important to consider. First and foremost, it recognized that youth participation needs to be seen as a requirement or an essential condition to environmental action and to peace building. Um, it's similar to um, the gender aspect where I think back in the day, climate change was just seen um, as a general, a general phenomenon that affects everyone. But as more, you know, gender research that come about to see that men and women are affected differently from climate change. And in addition to that, young people are affected differently from climate change. And um, it wouldn't serve us well to paint everything with the same brush. It needs to be recognized that different groups of people, um, in order for the policies that we have to be sustainable, it needs to be recognized that different groups of people are affected differently. Um, and so this document called for prioritizing meaningful youth participation and also linking youth participation to social, economic, cultural, and political levels, and also seeing the influence that youth, youth have in family, in schools, in communities, in religious groups, um, and so on. Secondly, the importance of intersectionality, which calls into questions socioeconomic background, and um, as I mentioned, the gender aspect with men and women, um, you know, you have the indigenous groups as well. You have the urban and the rural environments and how differently young people exist in these spaces. And in addition to that, the document spoke about, um, and it's important to incorporate how, if you wanna have young people in these discussions, they need to be educated. They need to be literal, um, have literacy in the topics that are being discussed and on environment, um, young people need to be educated to know how to represent themselves, how to advocate for themselves and their positions, um, and be given the skills to carry their own when they're in these rooms, policymakers. Involving young people at all stages of the process, um, you know, when, uh, policies are being developed, when projects are being developed on the ground, um, involving young people as actors, as change makers, not just as stakeholders that are affected, but stakeholders that can encourage change and bring about change. And finally, a point I wanted to, to stress on the importance of investing in intergenerational partnerships, where you have, I don't want to say young and old, but you have different persons from different experiences and age groups um, that bring wisdom, that bring different perspectives all in the same room to learn from each other, to understand the backgrounds, to understand the motivations that we have and why we disagree. I think it's important to understand why two groups disagree more than why they do agree because they might, you'll find that a lot of different groups are saying the same thing in, in two completely different ways and that their motivations are similar. But you want to know that unless everyone is brought together and that all points are being raised or recognized and respected. And so these are the strategies um, that have been adopted, some of them more than the other, but they have been shown to promote youth participation in peace, peace environment and security. And towards the end of, of our conversation today, I'll speak on um, how can you become an environmental activist? How can you become a peace builder and also advocate for young people to be more vocal in these movements? Um, but I think that's it for my presentation at the moment. Um, I think, Rishma, we can move on into the breakout rooms. 
and so the uh, i will read the questions now so the first question is what does peace and security ideally look like in your specific country context and what environmental events do you foresee happening within the next seven years that will threaten this reality provide specific examples and what barriers exist that limit young people from engaging in effective environmental and peace building efforts on global regional and local level what solutions would you recommend to address these barriers hi everyone hope all are back now so let's discuss and um we are really looking forward to hear your thoughts on these two questions so who would like to go first <laughs> Um, I'm still trying to process our discussion. It was a really fruitful discussion. Um, it was me and Ben. Uh, ben, he's from Albania. Um, I'm so sorry because I cannot uh, pronounce the organization name. Uh, he's representative. He's a Muslim or representative of, of uh, Islam, Islamic group. Uh, so what was interesting uh, in discussion? So. Albania is actually an interesting uh, example how multi-faith, multi-religious organization working together towards uh, promoting peace. But it's not only like on a, as I understood, on a conversational level, but also they uh, put it into action. Um, so, uh, and also they have the thing in like whatever their organization that they have in rotation that every uh the five religions that they have in, the, in their group uh like muslim uh orthodox catholic uh and also another i i'm so bad with names but another muslim sect Baktashis, that they all together uh, and also the evangelical church so these five representatives they always uh so they all do work together and they rotate the every year or every whatever like uh, season, they change the leadership. Uh, another interesting thing that they have a lot of work, um, different uh, youth groups, like interfaith youth groups, and they do a lot of work with them. Uh, one of the, so to answer the first question, I would say uh, the main uh, difficulty in the area it's the Balkans, um, is, uh, so in different countries there, it's a lot of conflicts happening. And like within the country, as I understood, there are also could be issues of, uh, or even like outside the country, different fanatics. And they are trying to uh, share their model, how they do things in Albania uh, to different Alb Alb Balkans countries. And, um, and especially right now with war in Ukraine, uh, between Russia and Ukraine. So it affects uh, the region and they're trying to actually bring this conversation that's instead of just like support, like only addressing or like uh, speaking for the peace in Ukraine, they actually man trying to manifest that actually we need to speak to both countries and like train and educate people there. Another question about youth, it's uh, that uh, one of the barriers in this engaging youth in uh, environmental and peace building work is that they're too busy. They're too focused on uh, digital world, like digital aspect of their life, but also they're busy uh, finding their place in life, like earning money, uh, working and so on. So that's why, um, that's challenging, I would say, as I understood. But they're trying to implement different programs. They have uh, summer camps uh, where they actually trying to uh, train and like ex like kind of educate and like uh, uh, equip uh, youth why this work is important and like offer the opportunities and also ways how they can engage. Uh, also. For example, there was an example that Ben gave uh, the during COVID times, uh, they engaged youth. So they were like 
uh, distributing food to different uh, vulnerable groups. Anyway, this is my summary. That we were like a uh, very fruitful conversation. Thank you very much, Natalia. You are a perfect one and the person. Thank you. Uh, well, obviously there was an, a lot of like different layers, but it's just like just to summarize uh, what I learned from Ben. You can add Ben. Uh, Probably I missed a lot. So no, it's a, it's a, it's a, what you say, and uh, I invite the the team to to visit Albania, and to to, to share experience and and to make together uh, a trip, uh, an interfaith trip. It's important if if you have time uh, in the summer, we can do something voluntary in this way, and it's good to see the other countries and to see the opportunity how we can make cooperation with. This small area in the in the Europe, the West Balkan is important for Europe and for the world also. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. But I think from my perspective, from the um, I'm representative, let's say Russia or representative for uh, because I'm here present in UK, and I think in a way, uh, so the youth um, hold the same issues. I will like challenges that uh, they're too busy to like earning money. In, in UK right now we have uh, energy crisis and like uh, cost of living increased and other concerns that actually take their time and sometimes they don't have much time to to contribute to this building but also on the country like on the other side on the positive side I would say from coming from Russia here a lot of people are surprisingly activists and uh, they are so strong in sharing opinions. And actually, I would say in a sense that could be, but it's not like I'm just saying in the general public, not just uh, faith community, uh, but I think that will be like for me interesting to study this area more because people are generally, uh, even like from school, I guess, trained to actually manifest, to protest, or like share their opinions. So again, there are like some challenging, but also there are opportunities where we can ask, explore and involve them in peace building. So yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Natalia. Thanks for sharing. And next group. Um... So uh, Father Julius was talking a bit about um, in Kenya and how there's um, actually a a kind of a growth in um kind of ele sort of um electric cars and things um and how there's kind of political will behind that so how that is helpful uh, potentially looking forward to um you know protecting the environment but then and i think the importance of that political will but then there's also at the same time you know still that environmental degradation and particularly because of um, kind of poverty and then as you know in the coming years it looks like that potentially isn't going to be addressed sufficiently and those resources that are there are only going to get kind of smaller and smaller um, and that how that kind of relationship between um the environment and peace and kind of poverty uh, can cause um kind of issues within a country and then um i spoke a little bit about the uk and how i think there's quite a bit of social division and um, kind of at the moment there's a lot of very much um I'd say sort of anti-immigrant rhetoric kind of thing, not kind of wanting to be open to asylum seekers and refugees. And I think that's causing a lot of um, division within within communities, within society. Um, and as how actually it's kind of almost been, um, that's that kind of, um, that kind of political uh, discussion is kind of also then being used to kind of um, almost try and silence kind of a lot of, um, environmental kind of aspects people kind of protesting against the for the environment and kind of um policies are kind of being pushed to the side and seeing as you know that's what those people talk about but that's not uh that's not what we should be doing that's not the important thing um and how actually that means that we're not going to be able to properly address any kind of climate um issues that are kind of coming um but also as you know globally we see a lot of um you know kind of the effects of climate change potentially there's going to be more kind of refugees asylum seekers fleeing kind of that and um, the problems to do with that and actually if we're still kind of being very much unwelcoming then that kind of all has a, a knock-on effect on the type of society and 
piece in society. Um, but then we kind of got talking about the idea of compassion and actually that's kind of something that we're often missing um, in these discussions. And when it was kind of the pandemic, everybody, you know, you had that moment almost where we were all in the same boat and there was a lot of compassion there for other people and how we're kind of missing that. But actually climate change is also almost an invisible energy um, an enemy even. So actually, is, is there something in that, those lessons that, that we can learn? Um, and then we we kind of got a little bit onto the uh, uh, question about barriers um, limiting young people from engaging in environmental and peace building um, efforts. And, um, you know, I think we both agree that there's so many opportunities like, you know, Zooms like this or social media, but actually that just that awareness of actually, you know, the, this is an issue and this is something we should talk about, maybe just isn't there for, for many reasons, potentially that there's so many things kind of competing for people's attention. Um, but actually also, um, Father Julius mentioned that young people kind of maybe need the resources and support to enable them to get involved in kind of peace building and working for the environment, um, you know, kind of economically uh, more than anything to to make sure that they're not kind of being um, kind of taken away to having to worry about other other issues. And I think that was a, a summary. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. And we can um, move to the third group and then we will have one more general discussion about the action. So I'm going to the third group, Abhutna, Cindy and Nelly, who would like to go. Cindy? It has to be Apana. Apana, okay. don't hide. <laughs> Come back out. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll start first. I've just come back from Albania and I, you know, I was blown away by Albania and that it is possible that their peace isn't because they were all nicey nicey to each other for generations. They came came through very, very, very difficult times. Um, and they managed to work together. Um, it's like it's like a miracle. <laughs> Everybody ought to know that it's possible because it's. As I said, because it's, it comes through such hard times that it is very real. Um, yeah, I think everybody should visit Albania. <laughs> but um, I'll leave the problem solving to, to a partner. Yeah, your turn. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. I got so excited when uh, Natalia mentioned that uh, Ben was from uh, Albania because Cindy was just sharing the story uh, towards the end of the breakout room. Uh, and uh, I was just telling, oh, you know, we should have some uh, online meeting or something where we get to get to hear their story as well. And then it got cut off and then we find come and find out Ben is actually here at this meeting. So it was nice to hear a bit about the organization, uh, Ben, and from Natalia. I'm uh, so um, uh, we started the first question and uh, I had said oh let's move on to the second one <laughs> Cindy and I spent actually a lot more time on the second question uh, and, uh, unfortunately I think Nelly was unable to unmute or something so she was unable to uh, we were unable to hear from her uh, but uh, I think uh, to put it really short we spoke a lot about intergenerational um the importance of intergenerational work when it comes to hearing young people's voice because one of the things I think um, uh, that when we were talking about barriers is often you you have young people coming with some wonderful ideas and you know um, t uh, about work and everything what sort of projects they have ideas for doing this and that and then often they the first roadblock discourages them a lot and that can lead to, you know, even just wanting to move away from pursuing that particular field or something. And um, Cindy was talking about how, you know, an older person's experience in that area might, you know, help you, you know, just overcome that particular barrier or avoid a barrier in some cases altogether itself. And um, in her words, ducking it. <laughs> and uh, uh, that sort of... Uh, sharing but then one of of course as with everything else what can often happen is intergenerational as i like choose i like the using the word partnership there can often end up going sometimes um you know into some sort of a difference in power dynamics can lead to 
that problem can arise easily in intergenerational situations. So uh, it was just, you know, having to think about how that can possibly be avoided as well. And um, uh, another thing we spoke about was security uh, in the, you know, in the first question that came about. And uh, uh, I, I, I sometimes, you know, peace feels more like, less like an idea and more like an ideal, uh, you know, uh, that when it comes to, it just becomes something that is, imaginative in certain countries you know security how it looks in our country varies so much uh with for, and it varies for so many people in so many different ways like um it was just brought up about all these cost of living crisis and things like that that itself is uh, you know it takes a step back you know sometimes even just having a roof over the head or you know just enough heating to get through the winter itself is a big uh security this thing that's not often experienced by other people so uh we had actually quite a lot to discuss and i think we'll just end up pushing this meeting so with the short time i'm going to stop now but uh yeah um I, I think we'll let the next room go if there's somebody else or just the general discussion i think i'll give it over grishma yeah thanks Abarna. we have like time to discuss more detail soon so uh, before that, I would love to hear from Dawood. He was in room two. So Dawood. Uh, hello. And I, I was in, in the room with another gentleman. And I think his name is Inab. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name. Uh, we didn't have all the questions ahead, but we did try to answer as much as we could remember. And um, so Inab was from Nigeria. And from his perspective, he mentioned that um, peace in Nigeria is more of uh, having security and stability, which I do agree because um, um, like all conflicts, war and so on, is a reaction to external issues, whether it's from the environment, whether it's to do with injustice, inequality, and uh, lack of job or education, it's just a reaction to the environment. So if the environment is a security, stability, a good balance, then there's no need of and uh, having any need of and uh, causing harm to another person. Then we mentioned about the environmental challenges in uh, Nigeria. And he mentioned that due to the global uh, global warming, there's a uh, high in um, sea rising issues. And which obviously making and difficult for some and uh, residents in uh, some neighborhoods. And if you know Nigeria, which is in West Africa, it has rivers and so on. So when it's a coastal, I mean, it, it has a sea. It's not a landlocked country. So when the sea rises, it has a big issue impact on it. And part of the global warming issues, the oil and Nigeria is one of the top oil producing and nations and so this has a so the envir environmental challenges has a direct link to and um, the conflict that's currently happening as well as the future ones and um, and then we moved on to the younger generation and the impact it might have on the younger people and uh, and uh, it's kind of like difficult to summarize this into one point and um, but some of the things we discussed is that the young people and their future has been compromised and uh, they have a very and uh, like they can't make solutions as easy as the gener generation could have like it would it's always easier to act yesterday than today things are getting harder by the by time passes and that's the challenges the youth are facing and um, and it's um, problematic and especially for younger people who deserve to have a, a bright future now their future seem to be more grim as not just in and uh, where we live in in Nigeria or I'm originally from Somalia I live in the UK and but also the, for the rest of the world because what one person does in one area affects the whole world and um and that is the unfortunate truth. And I'm not sure if I missed any other question, but I think we 
uh, I think I answered most of the questions, not all. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Dawood, for sharing that. And I know you are busy and uh, thank you for coming again. So, yeah. Now, Jamila, do you like to share the comments or any thoughts regarding the session, yes. like the breakout thank session? You. Yeah, I was taking notes when everyone was speaking, but I wanted to invite Father Julius. You didn't have an opportunity to speak. I don't know if you wanted to add anything else um, to what was said. No, I, I think I was well represented. Um, uh, maybe just to to add about the, the awareness. I think the young people need to be mobilized. I actually mentioned your idea about um, young people having competence on um, te new technologies and um, social media, uh, but maybe those um, skills and um, competencies are not uh, exploited better. So, yeah, those those are um, the opportunities that can uh, can be used to. Uh, actually mobilize young people to to get aware about issues of peace um uh, also someone talked about um if i'm not wrong i think it was a a partner that um you know uh, peace is an abstract concept sometimes very difficult to to grasp uh, about peace um uh, it, it takes a lot of time to to understand what is peace um, and I think maybe young people just will need uh, some time of mentorship to slowly understand what is what is peace. Um, so I, even for us who are in this forum, I think we are still struggling to understand um, the definition of peace is actually very, very difficult. We can, of course, we can conceptualize, but uh, to put it into practice is also another thing. So... I think that is what I can I can say for now. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Father Julius. And I didn't yes. want to cut off Aparna and Cindy. I know they had more that they wanted to talk about. Um, but I'll go back in order. Um, I think what I noted for Dawood, um, when you mentioned that you know, a lot of young people feel what's the point of fighting when things are getting more expensive, harder by the minute. Um, and I think Ashling mentioned climate change as an invisible enemy. You know, it's not something tangible. How can you fight against something that's not tangible when your main priority every day is just to put food on the children for yourself, food on the table for yourself and your children, putting clothes on your back, paying school fees, making sure that you have electricity and water. You know, if that's my focus, why should I care about climate change? Especially if I'm not even contributing to global warming and to climate change. Um, and I wish I had the answer I mean, even though this is the field of work that I that I'm in, it's still a struggle to find the motivation. Um, it's still a struggle to to find the reason to keep pushing and to keep fighting because it does seem as if it's it's all in vain. Um, but I do like uh, what Aparna mentioned of intergenerational work and receiving knowledge and experience from our elders. Um, you know, the, the the society that I come from, you don't ask your parents questions. You don't challenge the people that have come before you um, because they know best and they know everything and you kind of just take it, um, take it as gospel. And so I think it's interesting, you know, what would it look like to have young people and elders in the same room to learn from each other? You know, it's, it's very rare, at least in my family, for example, the young people can't, you're not allowed to talk back. Um, and so, you know, in a family dynamic, and I see the family as the foundation for the society, how can you achieve peace if peace is seen differently from young and old, peace is seen differently um, from urban setting or rural setting? And as you mentioned, Father Julius, it's very abstract um, and it doesn't look the same for everyone. So... Really great discussions. I did want to go back to Cindy and Aparna. I know you didn't finish, but I don't know if we have enough time. 
um, to dive deeper. I know we have more questions, Grishma, so it's up to you. Yeah, um, so Abrna left because, uh, yeah, like she has some other work. So, um, Cindy, do you like to go or maybe we can move to the next questions and have some discussions around that? That's also discussing about the limitations of young people and how can we overcome that? So, yeah. Yeah, um, in, in, in the conversation I had with Aparna, we we did go back a little bit about um who we are saying let the young people through to i mean who are we asking that and when we say that we're stopping the young people who is stopping them with the um the example of of Thunberg, you know she was ridiculed she was made fun of not only you know they, they they even made fun of her of her um slight disability that they're ducking the question they're wanting to not having to solve the problems that we have caused for ourselves because a lot of what has happened is natural environment change but a lot of it is also human um contribution so in in doing that, we we're trying to say that that if we can hold people personally irresponsible, and then we go further that we are responsible for our own household, our own families, and then we are the families together will be responsible for our own communities. Because if we say that somebody's stopping us, invariably we're saying that the politicians are you know rubbish, and that for whatever reasons, either personal gain or you know, corporate greed or whatever, that things that should happen to make us better get used to not harming the the earth that we come from quite so much has all gone to the way of the dodo bird, that we we know that there is a will to be res to be irresponsible, to deregulate, to make sure that they can do all the damage that they that, that people want to do in the name of profit. So when we get our young people to get into what they want to do, um, at the same time, I, I agree with, with Jamila that, that we, the education part is, is really important because when they open up their mouths to say things, we need to equip them so that they do not get ridiculed so that what they say has gravity, has context, it has their passion, so that you know, young people is that it's a force to to be reckoned with, to drive us forward instead of for us to put down and to forget, because they don't stay young all the time. They grow up and they get tired, and they get dis you know um, discouraged, and 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 we are destroying the best resource that we have which is which is youth um it, it is a very heavy responsibility especially because we're not helped by the governments and finding a way through that would, would be you know would, would be really good so <laughs> upon and i laughed at the fact that what do you mean seven years we don't even know what is going to happen in seven months <laughs> so 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 it, I mean, we're we're so beaten back that that we don't even have that vision anymore. That is how bad it is that we we can't even look forward to something good or something ideal because we are so bogged down by what is bad, and and what is destructive, and we've got to get out of that. Yeah. So yes, please go on to the next question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so thanks, Cindy, for sharing that. And uh, here I shared the questions on the chat. Um, so maybe we don't get enough time to discuss all the questions, but uh, take a moment to read and reflect on it. So the first one is asking about the what personal challenges, uh, like mental, psychological, economic, or physical. Do young people struggle with in today's society? And what strategies 
um, can they employ to overcome these challenges to become active members of society? And the second one is about how can leaders create more opportunities for youth to be active participants in policy making and civic engagement? And the third question is about the climate change and in the fight against climate change, what added strength and insight do youths bring to compared to other demographics and how can they be supported in their actions? So these are the three questions which we would like to discuss. And I also feel like sharing like from my own experience and when Jamila started her uh, session with saying like how effective the youth movements are. And as, as a founder of a youth initiative, like, um, like initially I was like so silent before starting Echo Peace Teen Cafe, I was so silent and I, I thought like peace building is like my purpose and it's kind of divine. So I thought like doing things silently and don't uh, like I I prefer to be silent and not sharing with anyone. But then I thought like when I'm doing work, I didn't get much uh, acknowledgement and also my work is not shared. So once I tried to share with others and also like promoting it I got like many opportunities and that opened up uh, like many opportunities and also I that helped me to connect with other young people and also sharing that opportunities with others so I, I think like it's very important to uh, share our work with the community like with the people through the social media so when we keep it silent and when we keep it, it with ourselves, um, like world cannot transform or change. And so I like from my own experience, I saw the difference. Like um, when I started sharing that also inspired others to start projects and even through Eco Peace Team Cafe, like I have seen like how people started their own initiatives and projects. So I think like we also like as a young person we also want uh, like we should break the barrier which uh, which has to be start from ourselves and break that barrier and come out and also about the uh, about the system like recently i attended one conference and as a youth delegate but when we were there the like the even the organizational committee or like coordination committee they were not um like they were not ready to accept us speakers or invited guests. So whenever we were there, like for food or water, we really need, they really ask us like, are you invited guests or you were just coming? So it's like, it's for weird. It's really weird for us. Like when we stand for the food in the queue and we have to show the badge every time and we have to tell them, okay, we are also the guests. So they are thinking like we are just entering the space just for the sake of like seeing the foreigners or like that. So um, so it's sometimes that weird, like even as an invited guest, we have to like we face some kind of discrimination. So after the event, all the youth delegates were saying that it should be like a, like a better <laughs> treated like because we all are like invited guests but every time we have to prove them we are also invited so when we shared this with the um, with the organization they were sharing that in the past like in the last years the youth were not allowed to speak like as a panelist or as a, a, a speaker so this is the first time they give us a space to speak so then we said like, okay, next year we wanted to speak in the plenary. Like this year we get just get the breakout session. So next year we need more space. And we also need like a um, like a space where we, uh, we get the respect, you know, like not just respect, like just treat us humans. <laughs> like sometimes we like uh, just in terms of maybe because of the gender or age, we are facing discrimination at different places. So, so yeah, this is coming up with, because of the frustration and sometimes we don't know like whom to talk. 
like whom to talk and who will take care of this so that kind of issues happening every time so yeah i'm looking forward to hearing from you and about these questions and also hearing your reflections and yeah and Gresham, you you actually raised a very important point um, there, um, which I was listening intently to. It's um, it's how we are. We don't talk enough about the things that we do good. Like I feel like now, um, you know, nowadays conversations are starting to open up a lot more about mental health, about like economic challenges and things like that. Like I think people are starting to talk about it a lot more um, because of the you know because of the prominence um, that mental health is getting. Like today's Mental Health Day. Um, and which is great. Um, obviously, there's more to be done, and there's always, always going to be more to be done. But um, I feel like when like projects um, to help people and projects that you know are actively run in the communities, um, which I, I take um, part of because my organization runs a lot of these volunteer projects, whether it's like helping the homeless um, or like um, you know um, planting trees or um, working with like um, uh, less abled uh, children, for example. Um, those kind of projects are regularly run. Um, and we have a very active like social media team, which will like, you know, take um, take videos and and kind of promote this kind of stuff. But it's um, it's important to like when you are taking part in these things to talk about these things a lot more like um, at work. Uh, you know, I, I've always found like whenever I speak about these things at work, like it starts like a really nice conversation. People actually start to say like, oh, you know, you're, you're doing this um, this weekend. This is amazing. Like, um, how can I get involved? Um, you know, and sometimes it's it's a welcome distraction for folks to kind of you know break away from their day-to-day uh, -day lives and get involved with this kind of stuff and not everyone's like social media savvy um, i mean edda sees like most of my social media posts and i obviously i'm i'm, I'm good at it and uh, you know I, I i do promote like events that we run and things like that but not everyone does that but everyone can at least have conversations right like that's that's at least a little bit easier right you just go into wherever you are like the next day your university or your college or something and say hey by the way i did this um and those are the kind of conversations maybe we need to start encouraging a a bit more i feel um or indeed creating forums where like these these kind of things are are discussed like like today's <laughs> so um yeah that was one thing one thing i resonated with um quite a bit so thanks for that um Grishma. anyone else have uh, any thoughts i'll shut up for a second <laughs> Yeah, thanks for thanks for sharing, Daniel. And yeah, um, uh, any other thoughts? Um, if if me, yeah. Um, I think it's kind of the first question that I then maybe want to link to the second question. I think, um, for a lot of young people, there's just it feels so hopeless, and you know, especially things around the environment, war, conflict. It's kind of easier to worry about the stuff you know to do with school finding a job like because they are big enough worries without having to worry about the global kind of issues but I think um so I think firstly there's a lot about strategies of kind of you know finding hope finding those communities and people that give you that kind of energy and kind of keep you at that those support networks um I think so I think that's I'm not sure that's a strategy as such but I think that is where um you know things that something that can help young people is you know seeing those stories and those opportunities for hope and finding the community that supports that um and i think there's something maybe about leaders also often particularly in religious communities we kind of almost expect young people to come to us <laughs> like they are going to come to us but actually is there something about going and finding those communities that young people themselves are creating and are finding but maybe are outside of the normal networks that we work in um, and so I think that's maybe something for leaders um, to kind of consider actually how we engage with young people, because young people are kind of doing amazing stuff, but sometimes it's outside of um, the the kind of traditional roots or traditional uh, political kind of spheres. So, yeah, that's thank you. I, I um, kind of have, have an observation that um in in encouraging young people to to um speak out more to recount their stories more and be more visible be more audible um one of the things that that is important is is education to equip them so that what they say and their demands are well informed um so that there's more gravity in what what they say and how they present themselves 
instead of just somebody young who has energy and just saying what they want, that they actually have the method of, of presenting themselves. So we're talking about environment issues that has a lot of science involved in it. It also has a lot of politics involved in it. And that's not the kind of thing that you expect young people to include in their um, narrative or in their um, in the demands. So they they come out and we hear their demands in inverted commas, and uh, maybe I'm wrong. People people find it easy to just kind of put push them aside because oh you you don't know what you're talking about kind of thing and as our world becomes <laughs> very unfortunately more tied together because of looming war um and i was just telling natalia this today that war is a pollution um it pollutes our world it pollutes our mind it pollutes our lives um it's it's a big big problem but how many schools or or places for young people to to talk actually help them to take on the difficult questions the the you know the dire the the unhappy um kind of realities so when it is no wonder that when they say that we we feel that they lack the the, the sophistication of what is involved in dealing with these problems so in part, as Ashlyn says, that we have to give them a place where they feel kind of comfortable in sharing um, and know that they are in good company in doing that, that hopefully organizations as ours help them to go beyond their comfortable confines so that they deal with things that they don't normally talk about, maybe too difficult, too horrific, too, too horrific, or that they are dealing with people who are not like them. They are diff different people, so that they have that um, that informed quality in their in their narrative. It's something that we know we should do, but it's time for us to sit down to think how we can do it um, to, to deliver it, so that young people can actually join us and get to a point where they can speak more eloquently, have more facts in their in their uh, speech or in their in their how they present their cases um, to be able to to grow up in in an environment where they deal with a lot of different people and a lot of different questions because I tend to think that there are we are dumbing down uh, education so that we feed them things that are almost black and white like so when they talk about it we, we just say yeah but that it's not that simple and as if it's not that simple can push them away and we really shouldn't do that um and how we can not do that it's probably by putting together programs that can help them to explore things that they should equip themselves with and to give them a place to to share so that they know that there are other people of the same mind who deal with the same kinds of problems, environment being one of them, war being the next, very unfortunate, but very real. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Cindy, for that deep um, conversation. And yeah, any other thoughts? Um, it's already the time, so, Maybe we can take one more and then we can move to Jamila for the closing thought. Yeah. Yeah, Jamila, please. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your thoughts. Um, I think our discussion today went off on so many different tangents, which is always good. And there's not enough time to delve in deeper, um, but I'm really happy to hear the different perspectives. Um, I even learned things about other parts of the world that I wasn't aware of, so that's always important. Um, when we have these kinds of gatherings, um, 
to bring forward different perspectives. So thank you for the opportunity. I did have a last slide, but to be honest, I don't think it's even suited, um, you know, based on how we ended today's discussion. But I did want to recognize what Janiel said that today is World Mental Health Day. Um, and conflating that with what Cindy said, you know, with the social media age and with young people, um, that the general narrative is that um, you kind of just regurgitate what's already been stated by the masses. You know, there's no space for nuance. There's no space for personal opinion. And sometimes if you disagree with what the general public is saying, you're canceled or you're, you're segregated, you're ostracized. Um, and I think what we've established today is that our realities are different. Um, several realities can be true and valid all at the same time um, and can be acknowledged. I think it's also important, um, you know, to recognize what we did say today is youth, peace, and environment. But I think it's important um, to lead by example in the life that you live. Um, and um, to also know that sometimes your impact doesn't have to be recognized on a global scale for it to be valid. Sometimes you can just impact the community. You can have impact on your family. Um, and that should that may have to be enough. Um, and as Ashley mentioned, you know, sometimes we only focus on what we can control because if we worry about what's happening on the other side of the world, it gets so overwhelming and it feels hopeless because there's nothing you can do really to help. Um, but I think what I want everyone to leave with today is the importance of having a relationship with the natural world, um, having a relationship with the environment, um, you know, I was mentioned before I lived in the in London last year and I was grieving that I didn't have a backyard. You know, I there was no sunlight that I can walk barefoot and I can, you know, eat fresh fruits that I'm so accustomed to here in Guyana. Um, so there are many things that we take for granted on a daily basis, having access to clean water, to fresh air. You know, there are people in, in other parts of the world who will never have that. Um, and for us to be grateful for the things that we have. So that's how I like to end. I know we're over time. Sorry for going over time, but thank you everyone for joining today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamila. And thanks to all participants who stayed uh, with us today. And uh, this is UK IYN Echo Peace Cafe and we host series of sessions. So please join us uh, for the discussions and share your thoughts and also we invite everyone to take action, take climate actions and for better and inclusive and sustainable world. So we will have next session on 17. We will be discussing how to protect ecosystems through planting trees. And we will have uh, Amanda Bennett. She will be joining from Costa Rica. So please join on October 17. So once again, thank you so much. And thank you, Demila. And Thanks to everyone.